Welcome back to episode five of My Clutching Guy. I'm back here with William Clausen of Ibex. We're going to go over a couple of things regarding the clutching weights and the fly weights that we use to adjust the weights on the primary clutch. William, how are you today? I'm doing great, thank you. All righty, let's get into this. So this is one of the clutch fly weights out of a clutch. The few pieces of it is your bushing, the ramp, and the holes for the magnets. <clears throat> we use magnets to adjust the mass of this flyweight. As I had mentioned earlier, part of the equation is mass and mass location. That's why we've chosen to use magnets, because we can move them around. So, depending on where the mass is, it's going to change the clutching characteristics of your snowmobile or UTV, correct? Correct. So, the factory weights don't have any adjustability. They're designed, and they are one size fits all. Right. But we've taken and <clears throat> provide a adjustable clutch weight. But that is only, like I said, a piece of this equation. The secret to the Ibex package over any other competitors, even adjustable competitors, is the shape of this curve. And that all is going to change how the primary clutch engages and disengages? Yep, it changes how it engages and disengages. It also changes um, <clears throat> how it shifts during the travel of the clutch. So from first gear up here to top gear out here, it changes the angles and leverage on the roller to actually shift the clutch more efficiently. With our curve, we run anywhere from 5 to 20% lighter than any competitive curve, therefore making this weight able to react much quicker because we are using leverage rather than just mass. So explain to me um, how I would say add or take away weight from this clutch weight. So <clears throat> you can have your stack of magnets. Number one absolute most important thing when playing with magnets is to make sure that they all go in the same way. But then you can load them into the holes as per our instructions. We spend a fair amount of time trying to come up with a package that gives you adjustability, but as always, with a little bit of understanding, you can adjust it for your particular set situation more efficiently. So one day, say I'm riding my snowmobile on a trails, and the next day I decide to go up to the mountains. I'm going to need to be able to change my clutching weights in order to adjust for different terrains. And I'll be able to do that with these weights, correct? Yes, these will have the ability to adjust quickly and easily. Um, primarily, the biggest reason you would need to is uh, major power changes or altitude change. If you're going from flatland sea level mm -hmm. to mountain high altitude, you will need to make a change because the horsepower of your engine has changed due to the lack of air at the high altitude. So it's going to change the way that primary gear... So altitude changes the way the primary gear engages and disengages? No, altitude changes the amount of horsepower the engine has. Oh. So the increased weight will shift up too fast. Oh, and what is the byproduct of a weight that shifts too fast? You lower your, your RPM, in turn, decreasing your horsepower even more. Oh. So it's an exponential drop in horsepower as you go up in altitude because not only do you lose inherent air that creates horsepower, you also lose RPM that creates horsepower. So will I need to add weight as I go up in altitude? You actually will need to remove weight so that you can bring your RPM back up to the peak RPM. So in this case, more RPM means more horsepower. Am I correct in saying that or not? Well, there's a caveat to that statement. Okay. The engine was designed by the manufacturer to run at a specific RPM, be it a four-stroke or a two-stroke. 
Four strokes, the camshafts open and close and have timings that are designed for a specific RPM. So if you're below that RPM, then your statement is 100% correct. But if you're above that RPM, you actually lost horsepower. So the camshafts in a four strokes or the tuned pipe in a two stroke engine uh, sets the RPM at which that engine operates. And as we calibrate the clutching, our goal is to make this shift at that RPM. So if it's above, you've lost horsepower. And if you're below, you've lost horsepower. So we are trying to optimize the weights in order to shift at what the manufacturer specified, no matter where your what your altitude is, correct? Correct. That's 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 pretty neat because as I you know move higher up into the mountains or say one weekend I'm I'm down in a in a lower altitude just doing some testing and as I move up I'll be able to adjust my weights and change them in order to hit that uh, deep snow powder days, right? Correct. Cool. So on a UTV, is the concept the same or is it just a little bit different? How do I adjust in a UTV? So on UTVs, the concept's the same. Um, you probably won't run into the altitude issues near as much with a UTV as you do with a snowmobile. Okay. So what's the benefit of changing out my weights and adding and uh, taking away weight? Well, what you do do quite often is change tires. A lot of people go from small tires for the trail um, to big tires for the sand. Mm -hmm. And even if they're the same size tire, but they're going from sand to trail a lot, um, the adjustability gives you a way to keep right on target. The other advantage with this particular weight is even if you're not going to adjust it each time you go ride, it does give you the ability to adjust it for your vehicle because most buggies are different. Most people spend a lot of money on accessories. They've mm -hmm. put tires, wheels, they've put stereos, they've put winches, they've put hitches, they've put more people. Mm -hmm. These various things can change. And so what you wanna do is dial it in for your most common way you ride. Right, so if I spend most of my time in the sand, in the dunes here at uh, St. Anthony, which is nearby us, I can set up my UTV for that type of terrain, right? Yes. That, that's, that's pretty good to know. So one of the things I would like to go into a little bit here is how we adjust these and what holes, because I know everybody wants to know which hole do I put right. the magnets in. So as a rule of thumb, normally speaking, we try and fill the heel first and our work our way out to the tip. That is a kind of quick, easy rule of thumb. It is not the end-all be-all. Some situations you would change it. What you need to understand is that these four holes or two holes on a Can-Am are speed related. <clears throat> so this particular hole adjusts your engagement to about 20 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. This hole from 20 to about 40 40 to 60, 60 up. Now, again, these are rules of thumb. They are not hard set rules of science. They give you a rough range. Every hole affects the other hole. So they all merge together and blend together. But it is a good idea if you go out starting from dead zero on good traction with um, four wheel drive locked in, you put the throttle to the floor, you watch the tack by 20 to 25 miles an hour, that tack should be settled in to the peak RPM by, given by the manufacturer. It should maintain that RPM all the way to 70 plus miles an hour. It can have a fluctuation of around 100 RPM. That's mm -hmm. okay. Plus or minus 100 is okay. But if you're seeing a consistent um, loss of 500 or 1,000 RPM, then you got too much weight out here. If you're seeing a consistent gain, then you probably need more weight out here. If at the beginning you're smelling the belt at low speeds or you're um, <clears throat> finding that it um, just doesn't feel like it takes off good, then you need more weight in the heel. Same thing goes for you know the 30 to mm -hmm. 40 range, the 40 to 60 range. If any of those speed areas you're noticing some sort of major change in RPM, that's where you want to start putting your magnets. Oh, okay. So 
Would I be correct in saying if I were to install these weights, weights incorrectly, and we'll just say it for example's sake, if I were to put all my weight right here, I would have very little engagement, correct? Yeah, so if you, if you quote unquote overloaded the heel, what you would notice is um, your engagement RPM is going to be really low, although that's not necessarily a bad thing, but what you would probably notice is when you hit the throttle, it feels dead because it doesn't, it's got so much weight that the attack doesn't come up to the horsepower quick enough. Mm -hmm. You want to get to horsepower quickly and then hold it. With our particular weights, um, we've designed them such that that's not usually a major issue. Mm -hmm. You can do that. What you will normally find is if you put too much weight out at the tip, which is why I said the, the rule of thumb is load from the heel first. Load from the heel first. So if I put all my weight in the tip, what's going to happen? If you put all your weight in the tip, most likely, um, let's just say we're on a Razor 1000 for example. Most likely you throw all the weight to the tip, you take off, you'll see the tack rip up to like 85, 8700 RPM, which is too high. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you hit 70 mile an hour, you might be clear down to 7800. And so you've lost weight. You had, you had too much RPM at the beginning, not enough at the end. So you needed to move the weight towards the heel. Interesting. Well, thank you very much, William. That's a good way to explain exactly how the weights work and uh, how they're going to affect both my snowmobiles and my UTVs. All right. Well, thank you very much for tuning in to episode five of My Clutching Guy. We went over the uh, primary clutch weights, which is the brainchild of the primary clutch. Next, we're going to be checking out the helix, which is the brainchild of the secondary clutch. Well, thank you very much, William. We'll see you next time when we explain the uh, helix on the secondary clutch, right? Yes, sir. All righty. See you all soon.